participants is advised for the following program. They believed he could move clouds, grant their wishes, and heal them with his magical powers. But one by one, they began to disappear. If he wants to have a more powerful magic, he must kill 70 women. Dia didudukkan ke dalam lubang dengan posisi duduk, kaki memanjang, baru dia melakukan pencikikan. Convicted for murdering 42 young women, Indonesia's Ahmad Saraji was one of the most prolific and hideous serial killers of all time. Dan termasih di mata ibu, ayo ke anak ibu. Mirian, tolong-tolong pernah ada orang yang tahu kok saya juga kayak gitu. Amandamai, situated about 900 miles from Jakarta on the outskirts of Medan, North Sumatra, Indonesia. It's an eerie little hamlet where sorcerers are revered. April 27, 1997. A young man walks into a vast, desolate sugarcane field to gather weeds to feed his livestock. Heavy rain the previous day has washed away shallow layers of topsoil. Within 10 yards of walking into the field, the man sights a large mound of dirt that looks unusually out of place. Alarmed, he rushes to inform the village head, Sugito. Sugito gathers a group of villagers to help hasten the digging process. Around 7 p.m., six men start to dig up the mound and its surrounding area. Into the night, amidst a billowing crowd of onlookers, the men unearth a rancid-smelling, semi-decomposed body. Immediately, the police are alerted. Naked, bloated, and putrefying, the body of a young woman is removed from the muddy grave. Recognized vaguely by onlookers, she is 21-year-old Sri Kamala Dewi. The victim's family is summoned by the police for further identification. It's a mother's worst nightmare. Jadi udah sampailah ke sana sama si bapak, Pak. Ya aku di sini, gitu, Pak. Bukan Dewi kan, Pak? Bukan. Jadi kepala larung aku bilang, bukan Bu. Udah yuk jalannya ada lihat, katanya. Lihat masih dibuka dari kaki segini, dari bentuk apapun jenis apapun, ya bukan Anda. Gak sempat lagi ngomong Dewi, Ibu terus nggak sadar sampai ke rumah sampai kesempatan harinya. Three days earlier. Dewi had left her home to run a simple errand for the family. She never returned. But after her decomposed body surfaces in the sugarcane fields, a 15-year-old rickshaw puller steps forward with a vital piece of information regarding Dewi's errand. Mendiang itu bilang pertamanya antar saya ke mana? Nanti kamu tahu katanya. Dia masih merahasiakan di pertengahan jalan, baru dia bilang uh, mau ke rumah datuk sebutan kami di kampung ini. Terus saya tanya, ngapain ke sana, Kak? Udahlah, Tosa, uh, Tosa ditanya aku ke sana ngapain. Sri Kamala Devi had visited Datuk, the much revered village sorcerer Ahmad Saraji, 
also known as Dukun AS. Permintaan untuk dijemput tidak ada setelah saya antar saya pulang. Namun pesan yang terakhir, keberangkatan dia ke rumah Dukun AS itu jangan dibilang siapa-siapa termasuk orang tuanya. But when Davy's body turns up in the fields, Andreas tells the story to her family and to the police. Setelah, setelah saya lihat, saya bilang ke orang tuanya, kalau tiga hari yang lalu saya antar uh, Sri Mula Dewi, Mendiang ini, ke rumah Dukun AS. Setelah itu, keterangan saya ditindaklanjuti oleh kepolisian. The police immediately approach Siraji's house and after conducting an extensive search, find several incriminating items. Among other things, Davy's handbag, her dress, and a charm bracelet. Siraji denies any connection with Davy's murder, but he admits he has already visited the crime scene and even consoled the grieving family. <laughs> On April 30th, 1997, three days after the discovery of Davies' remains, the 45-year-old self-proclaimed sorcerer, Ahmad Saraji, is arrested on charges of abduction and murder of 21-year-old Kamala Davy. But as the police investigation continues, the case takes on a bizarre turn. The evidence collected from his home point to more than one victim, but Siraji is not giving any details, not even about Davy. Periksa, kita periksa. Waktu itu kami periksa begitu begitu. Ternyata dia nggak mengaku mana bukti saya membunuh mau begini gini katanya. Udah nah, datang bapak itu pengomongan nggak bagus lah. Bina tanggau begitu kan baru ditangkap. Udah ditangkap polisi dia pun nggak mengaku. Nah, begitulah. As the police interrogation intensifies, Siraji slowly confesses, not just to one, but to a series of gruesome murders dating back to more than a decade. Beginning in 1986, the total body count is nine at first, then 13, 18, 23, until finally Siraji settles on a tally of 42 victims over a period of 11 years. It's an incredible confession. The investigation team summons bulldozers to dig up the sugarcane field that lies not far from Siraji's home. Shockingly, Siraji's extraordinary claims turn out to be true. Di hasil pengamatan saya dari mulai pertama pemeriksaan sampai akhir, ya, itu memakan waktu kan cukup banyak. Dan itu mengerahkan petugas, baik eh, kepolisian, TNI, Pemkap, yang sering serang, itu seperti stop. Kenapa? Ya, banyak yang sudah tidak dikenal identitasnya. Di perkiraan saya, yang dibunuh ini cukup banyak, lebih dari 42. The investigation team discovers a jumbled mass of bones and skulls. Sent to the forensic lab in Maidan, the experts are only able to conclude that there are 42 victims, all women, aged between 17 and 40. In a case that is packed with drama and intrigue, police adjust the charge of the single murder of Sri Kamala Devi to 42 murders. Ahmad Sirachi, also known as Dukun AS, appears for his trial in December 1997. But behind Sirachi's gruesome killings, is a motive that would stun the whole nation. Indonesia's Ahmad Saraji, a much-revered sorcerer, confessed in police custody to brutally murdering a total of 42 young women and burying them all in a sugarcane field. During a rigorous interrogation that lasted four days, Saraji revealed the stomach-churning details of his murders. 
He was made to reenact his method during a process of police reconstruction of murders at the crime scene. As Indonesians looked on, stunned and stupefied, Saraji revealed his baffling technique. The task he had set out to accomplish in order to become invincible was to kill young women, all for a peculiar potion, the saliva of his dying victims. So after strangling his victims, he quickly sucked their saliva. He believed that if he wants to get his powerful, he must kill 70 women. It's a twisted belief, and he must swallow the saliva from his victim. Saraji's bizarre and disturbing practice was rooted in his belief in the paranormal. For many Indonesians, there is a belief that everyday life is governed by unseen forces controlled by sorcerers like Saraji, known as Dukuns. A Dukun's role is that of a medicine man, witch doctor, priest, mystic, poet, and master of ceremonies, rites, and rituals. Psychologist Irma Manoli reaffirms the strong belief people have in the power of sorcerers and their use of extrasensory perception to navigate the supernatural world of ghosts and spirits. There are three kinds of extrasensory perception. That is telepathy, which we can read the, the other people's mind, and maybe we can transfer our own mind to other people. And the second one is telekinetics. Maybe when he moves the clouds to prevent the rain. And clairvoyance, if you can forecast, you can make a fortune teller about other people. Among the residents of the Sumatran village of Amandamai, Ahmad Saraji was the most respected and sought-after sorcerer. Known to villagers as Datu, a title bestowed on men of authority, or Dukun A.S., Dukun meaning a spiritual curer, he was respected for his healing powers. I heard that he can move the cloud to prevent the rain, and I think it is a kind of telekinesis. According to Joko Supriyono, who directed a movie on the life of Saraji, people expect sorcerers like Ahmad Saraji to solve their problems. The movie titled Dukun A.S. not only traces the life of sorcerer Ahmad Saraji, but also features original extracts from an audio interview that Joko recorded with the criminal immediately after his arrest. Sepanjang saya bertemu dengan dia, dia adalah orang yang sangat normal. Dia menyadari semua perbuatannya dan dia tahu risiko yang bakal dia tanggung. Dia pernah bilang bahwa dia melakukan pembunuhan itu dan dia sadar suatu saat dia akan ketahuan melakukan hal tersebut. Ahmad Saraji was born on December 12, 1952, to Javanese parents. His mother was a housewife. His father was a subsistence farmer and a practicing sorcerer. Nasib, meaning fate in Javanese, had a troubled childhood, which was anything but normal. Even as a young boy, Saraji dabbled in petty crime. Dari tahun 62 saya di kampung ini. Dari mulai dia, dia termasuk abangan saya lah kan, main-main dia sama. Memang dia dari mulai dia menjelang dewasa udah jahat. Sebenarnya tukang mengambil, mencuri-mencuri gitu lah. Terus jahat aja, dia berantem-beranteman biasa lah. After a rebellious and uneasy childhood, he ran away from home. By the age of 19, he was jailed for 10 years for theft and violent behavior. Soon after this release, at 31 years, he did time again for cattle theft. After coming out of jail for the second time, he became restless and ventured into the jungles of North Sumatra and began to practice sorcery. After his return from the jungles, Saraji led a seemingly unremarkable farmer's life with his three wives, who were siblings, and with whom he had nine children. As a Muslim, 
Sirachi was allowed to have three wives, but it was blasphemous that he married siblings, something his 79-year-old mother, Sartik, opposes to this day. During his 30s, Saraji offered his services as a sorcerer to help his neighbors. Word soon spread about his healing powers, and he began to have a steady stream of visitors that included local businessmen and government agents. But it was in the year 1986 that something mysterious happened and changed Siraji's life forever. In an almost ghostly apparition, Siraji remembered what his father told him when he was just 10 years old. Drink the saliva of dead young women to attain invincibility. Seventy women his father had instructed. And struck by this recall, Siraji began his mindless killing spree. Sirachi was arrested on April 27, 1997, and charged with the murders of 42 young women. The case brought national media attention. Believed to be a healer and a curer, Sirachi committed some of the most heinous crimes of all time. A lot of women want to get help from Ahmad Sirachi, and they obey. They follow what he said, even though it is illogical. Women frequently visited Siraji for counsel and for help with romantic issues. They particularly sought to cast spells to ensure that their spouses didn't cheat on them. The women were too embarrassed to tell their families of the visits. So when they vanished, no one connected their disappearances to Siraji. Mereka semua datang untuk mencari jalan pintas dari masalah-masalah yang mereka hadapi. Dan mereka percaya Ahmad Suraji mampu untuk membantu mereka dengan dengan cara yang cepat. The movie Dukun AS, inspired by Suraji's murderous spree, features his brutality in great detail. Suraji's method of murder was always the same. When women visited him, he would evaluate their spiritual needs and charge them. After he was paid, they would follow Siraji to a sugarcane field, where he claimed he had to bury them up to their waists in an already dug hole as part of a ritual. Complying with their revered dukun ultimately cost them their lives. Dia melakukan pembunuhan kepada setiap perempuan itu dengan cara dicekik. After strangling, he would twist their necks to suck their saliva. Dia dibantu dengan istrinya, salah seorang istrinya. Kemudian korbannya ini uh, semua pakainya ditanggalkan. After taking their clothes off, Saraji would then bury them with their heads facing his home, so their spirits would have a direct path to him. Ritual di ladang tubuh itu sebenarnya hanya kedok belaka, karena yang dibutuhkannya adalah air liur korban. Dukun yakin air liur dari 70 wanita yang mati berhasiat untuk pengobatan segala jenis penyakit. By swallowing the victim's saliva, 
Saraji was hoping to incorporate their power into himself to become invincible, just as his father ordained. Rekonstruksi terungkap bahwa para korban sepenuhnya percaya kepada dukun nasib, hingga mereka ikut membantu mempermudah pekerjaan dukun menggali lubang untuk mereka sendiri. Misalnya menerangi tanah dengan lampu sorot milik dukun. Apa katanya? Biar mama dua, nah, biar mama dua. Di sana ada biar mama. Kamu suruh atau kamu antar ke sana? Saya antar. Oke, okay. ayo. Antar, antar. Di sini ya. Nah, ada itu gimana? Ada itu. Sometimes, if paying customers were in short supply, Saraji would hire sex workers to take part in the rituals and kill them instead. With little family to look for them, if they went missing, sex workers were low-risk targets, and it would help him meet his goal of 70 victims that much faster. Saraji's mindless killing spree that lasted 11 long years came to a halt in April 1997 with the discovery of the decomposing body of 21-year-old Kamala Devi. It was the only murder where an eyewitness account could trace the last movements of the victim directly to Saraji's house. <laughs> Devi had hoped that Saraji would help her get back with her estranged husband. In a recorded interview, immediately following the police investigation, Saraji explained the sequence of this last murder. <laughs> Even as he planned to strangle her, Saraji kept reassuring Devi that her wish would come true. sucking her saliva, as he did with his other victims, Saraji took her clothes off before burying her. Three days later, a mysterious-looking mound was discovered by Sugito's nephew. The discovery led to a few other villagers approaching the field and starting to dig. Sugito recounts the day he walked into the fields after a tip-off from his nephew. What seemed to be just one corpse turned out to be a mass grave where 42 women lay buried. Proses pembongkaran itu lama dari sore sampai subuh besoknya ya perasaan macam mimpi perasaan ini bukan dia gitu walaupun itu dia karena masih ada rasa sok gitu kan trauma juga ya. Reporting for Vaspada newspaper, his motto is smile recalls that it was an intensive search spanning several days. Setelah kami ikut terus-terus secara berlarut, ya, bahkan kami juga tidak kenal istilah pulang, karena itu tidak kenal, bahkan kami liput sampai pagi, sampai dini hari terus main terus, ya. 
ternyata kami lebih menarik lagi untuk mencari mayat itu sempat menurunkan paranormal dari Jawa. Ternyata ini cukup ramai. Bahkan di sini sudah ibarat macam pasar malam. Nah, kalau masalah uh, koran atau media cukup ramai. Baik dari asing pun ada turun. Since it was getting difficult for the investigation team to find all 42 bodies, they summoned bulldozers to hasten the excavation process. But forensic expert Alfred Satio recalls that it was all bones and skulls that were discovered, making any identification impossible. Only one body was leaving to Sumar because they just happened two or three days before that, and the family is looking for her. So that match and then they have now the also bodies uh, for bodies the families came there but they cannot recognize exactly whether it's true or not because it's already um, decomposed yeah uh, you cannot see maybe it's worn already so there are four other bodies but no any family claim that as their real family and the rest is all bones yeah? all skulls of bones And so far, we cannot recognize as a real victim of their family. The forensic team established that the victims were all females, aged 17 to 40. But they were unable to ascertain if any sexual assault had taken place. We cannot find it exactly if rape happened. But this girl that can tell a lot about the sex of the victim, about the age of the victim, And sometimes if they have the teeth, maybe what the what the job is, maybe for people they like to electrician, maybe they they're on the teeth, you can see from that about 85% and 90% percent they have that. We need other findings like DNA, but at the time we cannot practice the DNA because we don't have the proper uh, sample. The enraged villagers of Aman Damai clamoring for justice. Ahmad Siraji was sent to face trial in December 1997. On December 11, 1997, 45-year-old Ahmad Siraji faced a team of irate prosecutors seeking the death penalty for his cold-blooded murders of 42 young women. Siraji's lawyer recalls that many legal advisors were hesitant to take up the case. Dia yang melihat karena dia melakukan pembantaian sampai korban yang 42 orang perempuan itu dia secara a priori menuduh itu orang yang sudah nggak baik kan gitu. Jadi secara hukum di dalam hukum kita itu wajib dia didampingi oleh seorang atau beberapa orang penasihat hukum di dalam proses I was at the trial, but I cannot say who the victim is. I can just tell this is a lady, she is maybe between uh, 20 and 34, and only that, because I cannot explicit telling the name of the victim. The other colleagues give also the same answer. Since the victims could not be identified, the prosecution team had a hard time gathering evidence against Siraji. Although he confessed to the crimes during police investigation, during the trial, he retracted his statement and denied it all. Begitu emang apanya beratnya ya polisi. Karena apa? Karena emang unsur materi hukumnya itu bukti-buktinya sangat minim ya kan? Sangat sedikit. Orang yang di apa semua udah tinggal kerangka semua. It took seven long months to gather all evidence and line up witnesses. It may have been tough to charge Siraji legally, but Kuzbianto feels that social opinion was influencing the judicial process. Dari aspek peristiwa itu, orang kan menubuhkan, ya, apalagi pihak-pihak orang-orang perempuan, ya, wanita-wanita itu sudah sangat apa, membenci sekali kepada si Dukun AS ini, karena dia... Ah, ini pembantai perempuan gitu kan, sadis kan gitu ya, tidak ada peri kemanusiaan gitu. Jadi jalannya persidangan itu lebih banyak di apa dipengaruhi oleh opini sosial ya, sosiologi hukumnya lah ya, opini masyarakat. Siraji's 
wives were also arrested in connection with the case and interrogated to establish the motives as well as their involvement in the crimes. His wives had a vital role in the process of planning and preparation leading up to the ritual murders. Kalau kau nak terlibat di sini itu, tapi kalau pemannya untuk membunuh itu tidak, cuma dia ikut melayani si calon korbannya, melayani yang mengiring si korbannya ini ke lokasi, ya istrinya, istri pertama, istri kedua cuma menyaksikan pertemuannya di rumahnya, si ketiga juga menyaksikan. The most important role of his wife is to spread the information that. Their husband is a great man, has magical power, and to persuade other people to use their husband's service. While Saraji himself claimed he was seeking magical powers, villagers believed he was only after money and sex. The motive is maybe sex and materials, and his wife keeps secret about that. The forensic experts were unable to establish any sexual foul play, and Saraji, in his interview, denied that his murders were sexually motivated. <laughs> Journalist Ismanto Ismail met Saraji at Maidan Police Station in 1997. Saraji had admitted to him that murder was an easy way of making money. Mas saya tanya kenapa itu kau lakukan? Macam mana uang? Saya ingin mendapat uang. Saya merampok di jalan, buat mula buat jaga di jalan. Dia bilang nanti bisa kena tembak. Saya sudah pernah menjalani hukuman berulang kali. Kasus perampokan sudah pernah. Bahkan pembongkaran rumah pun pernah. Begitu dengan cara begini. Menurut saya, dia adalah seorang dukun kampung yang berusaha mempertahankan eksistensinya. Seorang yang berusaha merebut banyak pasien untuk datang kepadanya. Dia orang yang mempunyai tiga istri dan sembilan orang anak. Artinya, dia harus memberi mereka makan untuk bisa survive. What made the case even more riveting was the fact that nearly 80 villagers reported missing family members at the local Maidan police station. Thus raising a question if Saraji had murdered more than 42 women, or if the investigation team had done the right thing to stop digging after discovering 42 bodies. Dia pikiran saya yang dibunuh ini cukup banyak lebih dari 42. Karena kan pengkorekan itu dia memakan waktu, begitu merugikan petugas, cukup banyak. Ia jadi putuskan sampai di situlah. The local media covering the story was intent on proving that Saraji was no sorcerer. If he had any magical powers, they wondered, he should have escaped from prison by becoming invisible soon after his arrest. But Saraji himself, during the trial, seemed to have accepted his fate, just as the meaning of his childhood name, Nasib, suggests. Kalau saya secara mengikuti jalannya persidangan, dia itu semacam sudah pasrah gitu menyerahkan bahwa dia ini uh, melakukan perbuatan itu, merasa itu perbuatan salah, begitu kan? Amidst a huge public outcry over his atrocious crimes, on five. April 1998 marked the culmination point in the criminal case of Ahmad Saraji, one of Indonesia's most dangerous serial killers. Seemingly unfazed and totally guiltless during the trial, experts said that he exhibited a lack of conscience and seemed impassive throughout the proceedings. My assessment for this case, I make a hypothesis that Ahmad Suraji is a man with antisocial personality disorder or well known as psychopath. Ahmad Suraji committed homicide in compost mentis. It means he did it in fully awareness. It means he is not an insane. Even so, a lot of people who learn about sarcasy, they become an insane people. But in my opinion, he did it in fully awareness because of, of his belief to get a powerful magic. Actor Wavan Vanisur, who played Ahmad Saraji in the movie, Dukun A.S., also believes that the criminal was fully aware of what he was doing. Kalau saya bilang, dia luar biasa punya strategi untuk membuat alibi. Jadi... 
uh, bukan dari hal-hal uh, uh, psikologis gitu ya dia enggak kalau saya pikir dia enggak dia cuma hebat membuat alibi merencanakan ingin melakukan uh, perbuatan yang jahat tapi dia rangkum dia sesempurna mungkin gitu sehingga 11 tahun loh 11 tahun baru terbongkar itu luar biasa On April 27th, 1998, following a four-month trial, Ahmad Siraji was convicted for his cold-blooded killings of 42 women and sentenced to death. Dari berbagai keterangan saksi maupun hasil pemeriksaan lainnya, Majelis Hakim menyatakan tak ada unsur yang dapat meringankan hukuman bagi terdakwa. Ahmad Siraji dinyatakan secara syah melanggar pasal 340 KUHP. Disambut ratusan pengunjung, dukun Ahmad Suraji hadir di pengadilan dan mengikuti pembacaan fonis hakim dengan wajah yang tenang. Following the verdict, Suraji supposedly lamented to reporters that he could not reach his goal of 70 murders. Lain dijatuhi fonis mati, terpidana Ahmad Suraji juga diwajibkan membayar ongkos perkara Rp7.500. Convicted with him was his first wife, Tumini, for aiding and abetting Suraji in the murders, and also sentenced to death. Tumini's sentence was later commuted to life in prison, a verdict that one person is unhappy with to this day. During the trial, the villagers of Anandamai, in an act of protest and anger over Siraji's cruel acts, ransacked and tore down his house. kandang kambing milik dukun AS uh, yang masih tersisa pada saat itu di bawah kandang kambing ini ditemukan barang bukti berupa jam-jam tangan korban sebanyak 20 unit kalau nggak salah udah gitu masuk pakaian-pakaian yang di sini sementara dukun rumah dukun AS hanya tersisa hanya tersisa kamar mandinya inilah kamar mandinya uh, rumah dukun AS di posisi belakang Sementara rumahnya dulu itu setengah papan, setengah tepas, dan atapnya atap umbia. Jadi uh, pada saat itu rumahnya udah diratakan di amuk masa, jadi sisanya bangunan beton ini aja. On July 10, 2008, nearly 10 years after the sentence was given, Ahmad Siraji was executed by a firing squad, shot in the chest, dying three minutes later. Jenazah Tukun AS atau Ahmad Suraji semalam dibawa ke RSD Deli Serdang setelah dieksekusi tim polisi dari Primo. After an autopsy to confirm his death, Suraji's body was taken to his hometown for burial. But even in death, Suraji could not escape drama. Yang pertama sekali ya memang yang pertama kali dari keluarga Dewi lah, kami lah. Ya memang gak ngasih lah gitu. As the police vehicle carrying Siraji's body reached Amandamai, the people blocked it and refused to allow the burial to take place in the village. To Davy's mother, burying the multiple murderer in the same village as her daughter was a hideous insult. Gak payah-payah, sama-sama kami jarahin. 
Following the controversy, Sirachi's body had to be shifted to a graveyard in another hamlet 50 kilometers away in Delhi, Sardang for burial. Pertama, itu rencana mau dikubur di, de- di dekat rumah orang tuanya. Namun di sana mendapat protes keras oleh masyarakat. Dan itu mau dikuburkan di lokasi tempat yang lain yang juga dikubur muslim. Juga diprotes alhasil dilakukan di sini. Inilah yang saya lihat kuburan Ahmad Suraji. Karena waktu pengkorekan itu, saya sempat juga lihat melakukan penguburan ini daerahnya. The burial on July 11th, 2008 may have marked the end of an era of atrocities of one of the worst, most prolific and dangerous serial killers ever. But Ahmad Sirachi, the witch doctor, the sorcerer from hell, managed to leave many hard to heal wounds. Tahu ibunya nih cuma di fotonya aja kan gitu. Kangen aja sama mama. Ibu sedih lah kok terigu. Marlon satu kawan sama Wa juga dukun Aisnya. Kayaknya nggak bisa rela ngadepi kenyataan. 